Cokesbury, I'm Maddie, and I'm a freshman here at Cokesbury Students. We are so excited to have you tuned in with worship with us today. Let's get started. Let's continue our worship by talking to God. Father God, we are so excited that we can come and stand before your throne, the throne of the almighty, the powerful, the ever-present creator of the universe. And we know that you invited us here by name. And at the very same time, we can run into the arms of our Father, a Father who knows our deepest thoughts, who celebrates our victories, who delights in our joys, who mourns with our sorrows. 
and who has invited us in. So God, today we are trusting in your power and your wisdom to guide us. Show us how we can put the spotlight on you in a world that sometimes seems very dark and even our souls can seem dark. But God, we know that in the past, what was intended to harm, you used for good and you will not be overcome and we can trust in you and we will know it was you. And God, we wanna sit at your feet because it's only when we take time to just rest in you at your invitation that we feel your peace. And when we feel your peace, then we can care for each other. We can love each other the way you designed it to be. And so God, as we continue in our worship today, we want to say thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. You never gave up on us. And because he gave his all, we are invited into your throne room and into your arms. So God, we give you this day. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. search the world but it couldn't feel me a man's empty praise treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together
everybody. Thanks for joining us this week for worship. No matter where you're at, we're so glad that you have taken the time to be a part of worship with us today. And uh, we're just glad you're here. And, uh, you know, at Cokesbury, we talk about next steps all the time. In fact, it's one of our core values. We believe right now that this is our one life to live. And so uh, no matter what this story is looking like because of how crazy this year has been, we believe that everybody still has next steps to take. And one of the ways that you can build connection and build community and take a next step is through our virtual small groups that are starting up right now. All you have to do is email Jill Stuckey and she will be glad to get you pointed in the right direction of getting to be a part of a group. I can tell you that group life is an important thing. In fact, I have been in several groups here at Cokesbury and uh, they've been an important part of my life. And uh, I just would really encourage you to do that because I know what a difference it makes. Right now, we're also beginning uh, a new virtual family and friends compulsion education group as a part of our recovery at Cokesbury Network. That's going to start later this month, uh, but this group will meet via Zoom on Monday nights, and it's going to be for anybody that would like to learn more about addiction and compulsion. So if you have people that are struggling uh, right now, and we know that lots of people are just in this time frame, uh, this is a great resource for you. Be sure to check out that friends and family group that's going to be meeting via Zoom. You know, your gifts make all these kinds of uh, ministries possible here at Cokesbury. We just want to thank you for giving. Uh, whether uh, you're giving online or uh, you're giving through the Cokesbury app, maybe you are sticking a check in the mail or you're just dropping by to drop it off and say hello to some of our staff. Uh, we appreciate it and we thank you for partnering with us to be making all these great things happen. Uh, we love you, and we're grateful for you, and we appreciate you. So thanks, and have a great week. For the question marks, this is for the outcast soul who lost control. No one knows. Sing it for the can't go back. Sing it for the broken past. Sing it for the just found out life is now upside down.
with our differences Together we are bolder, braver, stronger Hey everybody, welcome to Cokesbury. My name is Stephen, I'm the senior pastor here and wherever you're watching from, I'm glad you're taking time out of your schedule to be here. This weekend we're doing something really different. Uh, I know that if you've paid attention to the news at all, you know that our country is still grappling with not only the coronavirus, but we're still trying to figure out how do we deal with, confront, and then hopefully begin to extinguish the idea of racism in our country. It just seems like every single week there is another incident that happens that brings this back to the forefront. There's a passage of scripture in the Old Testament where the people of Israel um, found themselves trying to live their life under their own power. And anytime the Israelites did that, um, it got them in a really precarious situation. And so there's a prophet named Micah that God raises up. And there's this discussion of how do you deal with the conflict of a nation and get back to the true concept of following God. And so Micah makes it very simple in the sixth chapter of the eighth verse. He tells the people of Israel, if you wanna be right with God, that you have to do justice, you have to love mercy, and you have to walk humbly with your God. And I think it's interesting in this concept of justice as we confront ourselves with it that even the people of scripture had to battle with it. And the idea is that you have to do justice. You can't just talk about it. You can't think about it, you can't just be for it, but there is this call for God's people to actually take it and use it as an action to pursue justice, to be about bringing rightness for every human being in their relationship with God. And so this week I had a very uh, unique opportunity to sit down with two people that I love a lot, um, Pastor Daryl Arnold, who's the senior pastor of Overcoming Believers Church, and Antonio Mays, who works for Project Grad and is also the new head football coach at Austin East High School. And I love these guys, and I think they've got a lot to say. And so check out part of our conversation. You know, I've, I've wanted to have some form of conversation for a long time. And uh, you guys know as well as I do, our world is on fire right now. And... You know, we're all trying to wrestle with COVID and how we navigate forward and all that good stuff. But then you just look at the the ugly underbelly that's been re-exposed, I think, through this whole deal. And, you know, I think about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, you know, Jacob Blake, just this, it's just this constant stream. If anybody ought to be leading on issues of justice, it ought to be people of faith. And I'm having trouble finding that connection you know i know that one person can't do everything but one person can do something and i feel like i've got to help my people and our community's got to come together so that we can do something pastor arnold obviously our paths have crossed a number of years ago i'm just now getting to know coach mays um, my oldest son works at austin east and coaches with antonio and i just knew that you know, given what you two guys do and your life commitment, that it, you'd be two great voices just to have a conversation with. And so, you know, I don't have any great agenda. I just want to hear from you guys and, and your experience of what it's like in Knoxville and just sort of see where we go from there. Um, but Pastor Arnold, why don't you start off, man? I mean, I you're pastoring a, a, a fantastic church. You guys are deeply invested in the community. Just Kind of share your story, man. What's what's it been like in Knoxville for you? So I like to uh, I like to to just anchor on a statement that you just made uh, that I think was powerful, and I really believe it capsulizes everything that that we're experiencing right now. I think it was you said if anybody ought to be leading on issues of justice, ought to be people of faith. I agree with that. Uh, but I think that there is an addendum that I would add to that statement uh, is if there's anybody that ought, that ought to be leading on issues of justice, it should be people of faith and people of power. People of faith and people of power. And the reason I say that is because just because a person has faith, that does not mean that they have power. And so some of the people that are that are being 
um, treated poorly and marginalized and pushed out and people that are struggling with um, inequities, they are strong people of faith, but they don't have power to change the situation. And so we need, just to keep it 100 with you, Pastor, what the body of Christ needs, especially in our context in regards to the African-American experience and brown and black minorities here in Knoxville, Tennessee, because I can't speak for the country, is, is we need people of faith that have power to stand out front and be voices for the voiceless. When, when things happen in this city uh, that are catastrophic, um, such as uh, Eric Brown, such as, you know, uh, a, a, a shooting at the church, such, such as some type of racial discrimination, and even more in a very local sense, such as, um, you know, student push-out and, and uh, disparities among educational outcomes, I get those phone calls back to back, and those phone calls generally come from the majority of people that I am really, really close to, and they are white, wealthy people. The Lord has given me relationships with very white, with very wealthy white evangelicals that I absolutely adore. I, I house them and host them in my families, in my in my family's home. But what? What is so consistent is when something like a George Floyd happens and they want and we want to see something different take place in our community, the phone call call goes a little like this. Daryl, it's horrible what has happened. I hate this. This is not the will of God. What are you going to do to bring some sense of leadership to fix these racial issues? I hear that all the time. And, and here's the frustration, Pastor. I can't do nothing. The real question, the response is, no, 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 what are you going to do to, to lead and to help me? Be, because the, 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 in my opinion, the oppressed cannot get themselves out of oppression. Those that are enslaved cannot get themselves out of slavery. Those who have pressure on their lives cannot remove the pressure. They don't have the ability to do it. And so I believe that there are four different categories of people that are going to have to stand out front in order for, we, for us to see a transformation in real racial reconciliation that the Lord teaches us through the writings of Paul. Number one. It has to be the white politician. The white politician who is a born again believer and knows what's right has to stand up when they know that bills and legislation is passed to keep the minority in a box where they cannot move, even if it is against what their party believes. And so we've got to learn how to say, you know what, if my president believes something and I believe something different, just because we're both Republicans, I can love him and respect him and respect the party, but I got to stand up to him and say, that's wrong. Like, that's wrong. If my mayor has a different agenda, you know, it from her from her party, she has to have boldness to say it. If my governor, if my state representative, and so so the the white politician who has power has to stand up. Number two, the white preacher, the white preacher, because the greatest and loudest voice in our communities and in yours is the preacher. We are the mouths of God, and. And we have to stand up and say, no, I take that back. You have to stand up, Pastor, <laughs> and say, I know I'm in a six-week series on tithes and offerings and first fruit giving. I know I've been in a six-week series on how to make our marriages better. I get that I'm on a 
six weeks paths of homiletics and hermeneutics and exegesis of James. But when, when everybody watches the foot of a, of a white police officer on the neck of George Floyd and cities are burning down all across our country, I can't keep moving forward with my, with my sermon series. I can't. You got to stand up. And you got to say, I'm sorry. There's an elephant in the room, and he's pink. And we ne cannot continue with our agenda when, when the enemy is at work. And so my white pastoral ecclesiastical family members have to stand up in their pulpit and say, what is happening in our community in regards to the marginalized and the broken and black and brown people is wrong. And whether we believe in the organization of Black Lives Matter or not, Black lives really do matter. Now, that's going to cost you, right? <laughs> that's going to cost you. Let's keep it 100. That's going to cost you some of your budget. Because they may not ever say anything to you, but they ain't going to write that time check. You might have to let a staff go, and you might get let go yourself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So my white friends that love Jesus, love racial reconciliation, love me, understand this thing just like I understand it. Many of them are saying, girl, I get it. I'm with you. I just, man, I can't do it. Like, I'm going to lose some serious givers in my church if I say that. I can't do a six-week series on white supremacy and, and systematic injustice. I can't do it. I want to. I just can't. The third one, and I'm, I, I'm Russian. I'm, I won't say nothing else because uh, 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 the real preacher is coach anyway. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the third one is the white police officer. I don't know if you saw this. I don't know if you saw this, Coach, uh, but did you see when the riots took place, the, the, well, the, the, the protests took place, and then they sent the military in, um, and there was an older white gentleman that, that was protesting, and one of the military officers uh, kicked him, threw him to the ground, and busted his head. He was an older white gentleman. Do you remember seeing that? Did y'all see that? Not only did I see it, my wife and I rewind the tape to see which one of the officers did it and what was his body language on way of doing it. So yeah, uh, I know right. exactly what you're talking so about. You know what I'm saying? It was sad to see that that old white gentleman who was fighting for justice laying in a puddle of his own blood by people that are supposed to protect and serve him. And all he was doing was protesting. What was sadder than what we saw was what happened next. What happened next is a young white police officer reached down to pick the gentleman up to try to come to a rescue, and the, or the one that, that pushed him down pushed the officer and said, don't help him. keep moving. What, what that is, is in the hood, pastor, is called the bro code, right? That's called the bro code. That means even if I'm wrong, you stick with me. That's what we do. Even if I'm wrong, you stick with me. And, and we talk about Crips and Bloods and Gangsta Disciples and Vice Lords, but we don't talk about the Blue Gang. That even if you're wrong, you stick with me. And that can no longer exist. Somebody has to stand up and say, I was right there. He treated that man poorly. We arrested him for no reason. We pulled him over for no reason. I tried to pull him off, and they told me I was wrong and, and, and be willing to lose their jobs over it. And here's the last one, and I'm done. The, the white parent. The white parent. Because this is not very faith-driven and optimistic, but I don't know if we can fix this with our generation. I just don't know if we can do it. I think that the real fix is going to be with the kids because it's the kids that's out there protesting, not just black kids, white kids, more white kids. 
get this than, than, than our generation. And what's crazy is this is the first civil rights movement of all times in history that it was not led by clergy. Yeah, I know, man. And I, you know, I've got, I've got three boys and they're, they've all been in the streets. Uh, you see what I'm saying? I mean, they have, man. They're just, they are, I they're get They're not it. waiting for a preacher to get out there either. No, they are not. They are not. And so we have to sit down with our children. Watch that video. Watch the video of George Floyd. Watch the video of this brother getting shot in the back seven times. We've got to watch the Trayvon Martin video. We've got to watch the Freddie Gray video. Slow it down. Do exactly what uh, Coach and his wife did. Rewind it. With our children. Let them say, and then say, what do y'all think about that? You think that's right? May you never grow up and be the person that's got your neck, knee on the neck of a black man because we're all human beings. And just because we have the privilege, privileges, and just because dad and mom live in Farragut does not mean we're better than the people that live in Walter P. and, and Western Heights. I'm done. That's what I think. Well, Coach, jump in, man. How are you reacting to all this stuff? Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for even involving me in this conversation. Uh, I enjoy coaching with your son. Uh, I, I see why I like him now. <laughs> Pastor, I, I, I love listening to you speak. I, lo I love learning. And, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to be more of a sponge in this conversation, but I'm definitely willing to offer my opinion. Um, I come from a different part of the country. I come from Iowa. I come from a state where it's 3% black on a good day. Um, the side of town where I'm from is a lot like East Knoxville, which is why I feel so at home on the east side of town of Knoxville. Uh, so I, um, I'm going to offer a different perspective. I've had the opportunity to work in with black women, white women, because I'm in the education system and a lot of white men. Um, I work with very few African-American men in the professional rank. So what I see from African-American men uh, is probably a little different. Um, and because I work with such a wide range as a football coach, and my role, I am very cautious what I say and what I do to the kids because I know what type of influence I have just on kids. I can't imagine being a pastor of a church. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think, Pastor, one of the many uh, points that you made, the one that resonated with me was when you said that it's not going to be our generation. Um, I'm kind of a tweener. I'm, I'm, I'm closer to the age of you two than I am to the kids that I have. But what I've noticed about the younger generation is that they're a lot more accepting than even my generation was and the generation before me. Um, that has some good and it has some bad to it. You know what I mean? I come from a generation that we, we separated different things. We didn't, we didn't categorize race relation with homosexuality. You know what I mean? Um, now it's just a whole progressive movement. Um, I think that's why that's going to change. Um, the fear that I have is what you said. It's not being, it's not faith-based. You know, I thank God for the position that I'm in. I thank God for what he's doing in my life personally, which allows me to live a certain way for these children, because a lot of these kids have to see, you, you have to be able to compartmentalize certain things. And right now, a lot of our kids are just lumping things together and things need to be separated. In my opinion, I am, I'm, I'm optimistic because of the acceptance that our children have. I'm concerned because of the lack of faith. So that's, that's where I'm at. Well, and you guys feel free to chime in on this, but from my perspective, I, I feel like um, this is more than a blip and it's more than a wave. I'm hoping it's a tsunami of change that's coming. Um, you know, I've always... Over the last six months, as we've dealt with this this virus, you know, it's I don't know about y'all, but it's caused me to really look inside, and um, it's almost been a gut check on why I do what I do. And you know, there, there, you know, Pastor, you know this. There's not a preacher on the planet that knows how big their church is right now. <laughs> That's right. Um, how small, <laughs> but you know, the, the thing that I keep coming back to is, um, 
which which you guys being men of faith understand that there's there is a better day coming and it's promised in scripture and between this day and that better day um, we've all got to keep our nose to the grind and the last thing I want to do is get to my grave and look back and realize you know I wasted an opportunity that God gave me and one of the things I've, I've been teaching our trying to teach our folks for over the past year in particular is you got a choice in life you can make a point with your life or you can make a difference with your life and we got a whole lot of point makers in our world right now and there seems to be precious few people that actually have the the fortitude to want to make a difference and you know i i don't know what the answer is but i do know that somehow some way we got to keep putting one foot in front of the other and and trying to to be jesus to people and and you know what it's easy for me to say well this ain't right and then you know exactly what you said, Daryl. I hope y'all do something great. You know, I, I'm, I've got your back. It's a whole new ball game to say, no. Nah, you know, we, we actually want to hold hands and get out there in the fight with you. And I feel like, and it is an I feel statement, but I feel like most of the people in my sphere feel the exact same way. They want to engage. They're probably dealing with some level of fear, but then they don't know how to engage. You know, um, how do you be an ally? How do you how do you take that stand? Um, how do how do you find that one thing that allows you to make the difference? And you know, I I don't know. I, I've always tried to raise my boys with the idea of of what I just said that you know you only got one shot at life, and you're either going to make a make a lasting impact or you're just going to squander it away and. And coach, that's really one of the things you know, I've watched you over the past couple of years and as you've stepped into this new role this year, it's obvious that you're making an impact with your life. And, you know, people don't get to see you inside the building, they see you outside the building. Um, and and I know you're making a difference, but. If I could say I, something, if you don't yeah, mind. Do yeah, jump in. You know what I like to do, I like to eat pastors. You know, I like to sit down and just have a meal together. One, I'm, I'm part of a, the Knoxville Rotary chapter here, uh, Volunteer Rotary, and we have uh, Friday lunches together. Um, the first thing I said from the first meeting, oh, I'm the only black, the black man in the, in the, in the whole meeting. This is a pretty big meeting. Then we got a younger black uh, guy who's since moved. But we eat together and there's a there's a lot of strong opinions that go on in there. But, you know, they um, I would like to think everybody in there is, are caring individuals. We were on a, a, a Zoom meeting and at the end of it, I said, you know, before I go, I just want to ask a question. I, I, you know, I just the question about us. And the time that we're in right now and some talk and some didn't. But I think what allowed us to have that conversation was that we sit down and we eat together all the time. We know each other, whether if it's uh, one time a week, uh, maybe twice a month. You know, if you sit down at the table and just talk to people and get to know people for who they are and, and build on your, your, your interests, I think that's where we begin at. You know, it's, it's going to be hard to have this conversation with individuals who don't know each other. You, we do need to have some of those conversations, but we had a, um, we had a get together at our last in the squad scrimmage where I brought military personnel, different members of the uh, faculty and staff to talk about their interpretation of kneeling for the flag. And I purposely brought people together that had differences of opinion, but the kids knew everybody that were talking. So we were able to have that conversation. And it was even tough for us. I knew I had to have the conversation when I didn't want to go out for the national anthem. You know what I mean? So, um, but I was able to have that conversation specifically with our ROTC because we were neighbors. You know, we had already built the relationship. So, you know, I think we have to start with eating. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an old country fat boy, but just just sit down and eat with each other. You know, uh, Daryl, what you were saying about um, about parents, man, um, I, I get it. Uh, you know, I, I see. I think that's where I find a have found a, a deep sense of hope, um, basically across the board, man. It's watching 
the people that are coming up behind us with, you know, and I think you can anticipate the group that's going to come up behind them. Um, and I think that that's how you, you know, you step, you step closer toward wholeness and healing, you know, with each new generation. And what, um, if, if you take, uh, just take the the mess our world's in, man. Where where would you land just on you know for the average human being that's trying to find hope? What what would you say? You know, I, I think that Antonio was right. You know, I'm optimistic. Also, I think through you know I think through our ministry and um, kind of what we have been doing in the last few years and I, I almost felt like I was running out of vision pastor. Uh, I did, man. Uh, I've been struggling for the last couple of years. Like, man, am I still in the right place? Am I supposed to be here? Cause when I feel like I'm losing vision, I, I you know, maybe my time is up. And so I've been kind of praying through that. Like what's next? You know, we put the chain center up and, uh, you know, kind of start working through this gang stuff and got the building up and people's lives being changed. Then I just felt like, man, I feel like I'm hitting a, a, a vision wall here. Like, what's going on? And and I was studying the life of Christ. I do that about every two years, just kind of walk through the life of Christ, these individual um, things that he did while he was here in the earth. And I found out that Jesus was not just a problem solver, he was a problem seeker. <laughs> he was look. the dude was looking for problems. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, you, you if you just kind of gray, you know, surface, if you kind of look at the surface of the scriptures, you just think that problems kept coming to Jesus. But I don't know if that's the case. I, I don't know if, if problems kept coming to Jesus. I think Jesus just was always looking for problems. And he knew that my glory can only be made manifest in the context of problems. And I think that oftentimes, if I'm honest, I don't want to look for problems. I kind of run away from problems in ministry you know? and problem makers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like when you, your phone rings, you're like, oh, Lord, not them, right? Because you know it's a problem. And the Lord just really spoke to me and said that COVID, um, social and civil and racial unrest and protest and death and political chaos that we're experiencing are all great opportunities for me to be glorified and fix some problems. And so you have to, if I don't look at it out of that, that lens, I'm going to get, I'm going to feel crazy. I'm, you know, I'm going to want to just quit. Like, I can't get to my pulpit. I can't hug my people. I can't do what I do. And really, my passion in the last six months really began to come back since COVID because God is being glorified through the problems that we've experienced. And so you don't have to start trying to figure out figure out what to do in ministry. Oh, it's a whole lot to do in ministry, and most of it is not behind the microphone. And so I think that there's hope, man. I think that there's hope. I'm seeing the transformation of lives. I'm seeing people get born again over Facebook Live. Although I've had to preach funeral after funeral, and many of them are COVID connected. I'm seeing people get born again at these funerals. I preached three funerals in the last three weeks and 36 people have said yes to Jesus in funerals. And so you take these, these deficits that the enemy puts in our lives and use them as platforms to give God glory and it's giving, it's, it's, it's allowing us to let our light so shine that me and may see our good works and glorify our Father. So I'm with you, Antonio. I, I'm, I'm Pastor, let me let me say just one more thing. Let me say just one more thing, and I want I, this is a preacher piece, right? This is a preacher thing. So I just did a series called "Meet Me in Heaven," right? 
And um, so I was just kind of walking through the things in Revelation that speak of pictures of what heaven is going to be like. And man, I ran across a passage, and I think it is in Revelation 21, the last verse, I think, it could be 20, that said that when John looked out into the heavenlies, the last verse he says, and there was no temple there. I said, what? We're going to get to heaven. We're going to worship. We're going to serve God. and ain't no temple there. And God said, that's what COVID is for. It's to prepare you to serve me and to worship me and to give me glory. And there's no temple there. That's where he wants us, man. You know what I'm saying? He wants us to give testimony without the temple. Yeah. You know, at least here in Knoxville, it came as such a shock. I mean, we were literally one day yep. on, that we had to shift everything online, but it's been fascinating. Um, you know, there's this, I, I don't know how COVID has been for you guys, but for me, the, the one thing it's not fear, it's not lack of information. It's you can't get away from it. And it's just that downward force on your shoulders, no matter where you go. And the thing that's been interesting is um, I think it's been a refiner's fire. I know it has for our church, and I suspect every church, and I have a feeling it's been that way for every family, is you figure out real quick what is it that really matters. And, you know, I find it interesting that in 2020, the church has to operate like it did in the very beginning. They didn't have buildings, no buildings, no nothing. They met in people's homes, they shared meals, and they went about the work of Jesus. And, you know, it's just, it's going to be amazing to see what happens come out of this. You know, one of the things I don't want is to ever go back. Yes, sir. To the yes, sir. Ones. There's yes, no doubt about that. Coach, what would you add? Anything you want to add before we get out of here, man? No, I just appreciate being involved in the conversation, gentlemen. Well, you two guys, listen, um, I, I I got mad respect for y'all. Um, you know, I, I like to associate myself with people that want to make a difference. And, you know, I know you two guys have watched you do it. Um, you're about making a difference. And, I, you know, obviously we ain't going to solve the world's problems in a 30-minute Zoom meeting, but um, – I also, I don't know that I can put into words how much I appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedule because it's, you know, I, if I had the time to tell you all my background, um, you know, my dad raised me to be better than he was, and I've tried to raise my boys to be better than I am. And um, there's so much junk in my past that I've tried to push through and to be able to to sit Pseudo eyeball to eyeball with you two guys is a big deal to me. And, um, you know, I just want you to know I love you and, and just really appreciate who you guys are and what you're doing. Um, hey, Daryl, would it be too weird if you just sort of said a quick prayer for us and we'll part ways? By no means. Father, it is to you that we give the glory, the honor, and the praise. We thank you for your commitment to the kingdom, for giving us the keys to the kingdom. Your word teaches us that any man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for it. And Lord, a lot of us feel like looking back sometimes with COVID and conflict and all types of chaos that hits our lives. Lord, sometimes we just want to take our hand from the plow and look back. But I thank you, Lord, that when we want to give up on you, you won't let us give up on, on you. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of reconciliation, that you've reconciled us back to you, but then you've given us the ministry of reconciliation. And so I give you praise, Lord, for Pastor and for um, his wonderful church and his staff, Lord, that, that is operating in that ministry, that this is a step for reconciliation to take place in the earth. May God, what he is doing in the 30-minute Zoom meeting, be contagious. May this happen in every city, in every town, in every valley, in every mountain, in every place, God, that you have 
put your fingerprint on. May God, you bless their church for being faithful to doing justice. Now, Lord, you said if any of us lack wisdom, we could ask of you and you would give it to us liberally. We all lack wisdom. We don't know what to do. And so, Father, we're going to ask you for insight and divine wisdom so that we might know what next steps we need to take so that we can be what Jesus prayed, one, as you and your son are one. I call them blessed in the city and in the field, and they're lying down, they're gathering. I call favor to go before us all, goodness and mercy to follow us. May Christ continue to live in us, which gives us the hope of glory. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. We love not our lives, even unto death. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen.